Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's special bonus webinar, Donor Heart Preservation in the 21st Century. This webinar is sponsored by Paragonics Technologies, a proud corporate partner of the Alliance. Paragonics is a provider of organ transportation devices that safeguard organs during the journey between donor and recipient patients. For more information, please visit paragonics.com. My name is Deanna Fenton, Program Manager here at the Alliance, and it is my pleasure to host today's presentation. Now, before we begin, there are just a few housekeeping items that I'd like to review with you all. As always, it is highly recommended that you access our webinars using the Chrome browser in order to ensure an optimal visual and audio experience. So if you're already using Chrome and continue to experience any issues, please try reconnecting to the webinar using the phone number that was provided in your confirmation email. Now to those of you who are joining us for the very first time today, please take note of the chat feature that's located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. This chat will be used to pose your questions to our presenter. So if you have any questions that come up during the course of the webinar, please feel free to submit them at any time. Once the presentation has concluded, we'll have some time for our presenter to address as many of your questions as time allows. Now, in regard to our upcoming webinars for 2020, please note registration is currently open for our very first transplant webinar of the year, Cell-Free DNA and Transplant Assessment. That's coming your way on January 28th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Registration is also open for our upcoming webinar entitled Medical and Legal Aspects of Family Conflict with the Medical Team at End of Life. That's coming your way on February 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern. For more information on either of these webinars or to register, please visit our website at organdonationalliance.org. Now, for anyone seeking um, continuing education credits, we are offering one set fee credit and one nursing contact for this webinar. Please note, we do also offer a certificate of attendance for anyone that's seeking CEs that are not available. Everyone joining us today is eligible to claim either of these credits or certificates. Prior to receiving your certificate, you will be asked for some very brief online evaluation that will allow you the opportunity to provide us with your valuable feedback. If you're listening in a group, please be sure to get the evaluation email from your group lead. As a reminder, for nursing, you'll have 14 calendar days to complete your evaluation, and for set C, you'll have 30 calendar days. Now at this point in time, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, our very own Corey Bryant, Director of Communications here at the Alliance. Corey, we're so glad to have you with us today. And at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to introduce our presenter. All right, thanks, Deanna. And hi, everyone, and a happy early Thanksgiving to you all. I am pleased to present Dr. Clinton Kemp, a cardiothoracic surgeon from Centara Norfolk General Hospital in Norfolk, Virginia. Dr. Kemp is board certified in general surgery and thoracic surgery and has been named a top doctor by Coastal Virginia Magazine. He specializes in all aspects of adult cardiac surgery, including coronary artery bypass grafting, valve repair and replacement, transcatheter valve replacement, aortic aneurysm repair, heart failure, mechanical circulatory support, and heart transplantation. He also specializes in general and oncologic thoracic surgery. In his free time, Dr. Kemp and his wife, Jean, a dermatopathologist in the U.S. Navy, enjoy spending time with their two children and trips down to the Outer Banks where Dr. Kemp spent time growing up. Dr. Kemp, we're pleased to have you with us today, and I'll now turn it over to you to begin our program. Well, thank you very much, Corey, and thank you to the Alliance for allowing me to present this webinar. <clears throat> As Corey mentioned, I'm Clint Kemp. I'm one of the heart surgeons, uh, heart failure and transplant surgeons at Centera Healthcare in Norfolk, Virginia. I am a consultant for Medtronic and Edwards and have received honoraria from Paragonics. So the objectives for today are fourfold. First, we're going to describe the donor heart procurement process. Then we'll discuss the science and the background behind cold preservation. We'll learn about traditional methods for cold preservation, and then finally look at novel methods for cold preservation moving forward. Just a bit for background, there are 5 million Americans living with heart failure today. Over 500,000 new cases are diagnosed each year. There are many different treatments for patients with heart failure. These range from guideline-directed medical management to left ventricular assist devices, and then finally heart transplantation. The first successful heart transplant was performed in 1967 in South Africa by Christian Barnard. 
This was followed up shortly by Norman Shumway, his mentor, here in the United States in 1968. The last calendar year for which we have complete data, 2018, there were over 3,000 heart transplants performed. Since 1988, over 75,000 heart transplants have been performed. Unfortunately, there are almost 4,000 patients who are active on the heart waiting list, which means there are more potential recipients than available donors. Hearts are allocated through a system administered by the United Network for Organ Sharing, or UNOS. In general, distribution of donor hearts is based upon status, how ill a patient is, position on wait list, which generally has to do with how much time they've been on the wait list, and I put geography in parentheses because this played more of a role for the former uh, allocation system, and we'll talk about the differences and how the new allocation system will impact that. The country is split up into 11 different UNOS regions. And as you can see, in the Northeast, where the population is more dense, these regions are smaller, usually only one or two states. As we move to the Midwest, the South, and the West, these regions are less densely populated and therefore include many more states. Within these regions are organ procurement organizations. These typically follow similar patterns to the UNOS regions in that the states that are more densely populated have more OPOs. For instance, Pennsylvania has two, New York has three, California has four. The states in the middle of the country in the south and in the west tend to have one organ procurement organization per state or even partially in another state as well. This next slide depicts on the left the former allocation system and status listing, and then on the right, the new system which came about at the end of 2018. In both systems, status is classified by how ill a patient is. The lower the number or the higher the status, the more likely one is to receive an organ. For the former system, former status 1A were patients at the top who were very sick, patients on ECMO, patients with a total artificial heart, patients who couldn't be discharged from the hospital before their transplant. However, also included in status 1A were patients with LVADs and device-related complications. This could be as simple as a driveline infection for which they were being treated at home with oral antibiotics or flow alarms, which, albeit annoying on the controller, still allowed them to be at home and otherwise live their life. Most patients with an LVAD that didn't have complications were status 1B. The reality was the patients in status 1A would get transplanted. A lot of patients in status 1B would also get transplanted. When the system created a different status and different allocation rules, the thought was to allow the patients that were truly the sickest to have the best access to hearts. So the new status one are truly patients who cannot be discharged from the hospital. Those on VA ECMO, those with biventricular VADs not allowing discharge from the hospital. Status two and three are also similarly ill. However, what you notice as you go down further, these LVADs that are stable are now status four. Even a left ventricular assist device patient with a life-threatening complication is now only a status three. And although this system has not been in place for, for just about a year, right now, at least at our center, we're seeing that patients with status one get transplanted relatively quickly. Those with status two, also quickly. Status three are a lot harder to find hearts for, and status four and beyond, those patients generally are not coming up for matches in our region. So in summary, the new system is based upon how sick a recipient is. The old system offered hearts within that organ procurement organization first, then if there were nobody on the list or no takers, they were offered up regionally, then finally nationally. The new system, in addition to changing the allocation score, actually offers those with high status, meaning those one and two, organs from a 500-mile radius. The advantage of this is more available hearts per recipient. The major disadvantage, however, is the distance required for, uh, for travel to procure a donor heart. So taking a look at maps in terms of the two different allocation systems, the map on the left represents how it used to be done. So that's a map just showing the East Coast with those organ procurement organizations. And I'll put the cursor up here and show you where we are. Here's where we are in Norfolk, Virginia. So if we have a patient who is high up on the list, former status 1A, 
and an organ came up in Virginia, that organ would be kept in Virginia among the transplant centers in the state. If there was nobody in the state who wanted it, it would then be offered up locally, regionally, and then finally nationally. Now move on over to the other map, and this is just a map I took of Google. This is where we are, and I asked Google to place a 500-mile radius around us. So what you can see now is my patient who's status one or two now has access to organs all the way up here in New Hampshire, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and then all the way down to Georgia with everybody in between. The advantage to my patient is he or she has access to a lot more organs. The disadvantage is those patients in other centers which may have longer lists and more patients in Philadelphia, New York, Boston, also have access to those same hearts in our region. So in summary, there are 5 million Americans with heart failure currently. There are nearly 4,000 patients on the wait list for a heart with only 3,000 heart transplants performed per year. The new allocation system makes it more likely for not only for us to have sicker recipients, but also for us to need to travel long distances for donor hearts. So at the end of the day, we need to have excellent preservation of all these donor hearts for success, not just for our patients who are getting transplanted, but to make sure we use all these organs in a safe and responsible manner. So first, we're going to go into the donor heart procurement process. Once a heart has been accepted by a, by a site, a donor team is assembled. This typically consists of a procurement physician, his or her assistant, and an organ procurement organization coordinator from the local OPO. This team then travels to the donor hospital with the increase in range. Typically, this is more plane or helicopter and less ambulance. And the key thing to remember is these cases typically happen overnight, early in the morning. Oftentimes, they're being performed by the call OR and anesthesia team who may not have had experience with a transplant and certainly may not have had experience with cardiovascular operations. In addition, to try to minimize the impact on the donor hospital who has graciously allowed us to come there perform the procurement, oftentimes this is not in an ideal room. This is in a room to not disrupt the normal flow at the hospital. Once we arrive to the site, we meet up with the host from the on-site or the local organ procurement organization. The other thing to keep in mind is there's multiple other teams present. Abdominal teams can be one, taking liver, pancreas, and kidney, or can be two, a separate liver and separate pancreas kidney. Oftentimes, there's a lung team present as well. So we can have up to four teams in the same space performing procurements. And what I did for this next slide was just Google uh, organ procurement. And these are two stock photos that came up. So typically in an operating room, it's the surgeon, his or her assistant, the scrub tech, and an anesthesiologist, and a circulating nurse. Here you can see in both pictures, there are multiple teams of, of physicians and assistants all needing to get into the same space. I would argue that donor heart procurement is the single most important part of a heart transplant. The reason why is that mistakes made during procurement have ramifications for the entire process and outcome. Good preservation of the donor heart is the hallmark of a good procurement. And one important thing to remember is a good procurement won't necessarily lead to a good transplant, but a bad procurement can lead to problems down the road. As said before, this is multiple teams working simultaneously in the same space. We perform a median sternotomy, the abdominal team, a midline laparotomy. Although on paper and based on echocardiogram and oftentimes left heart cath, the heart appears to be a good, a good donor, there's nothing that substitutes for visual and hands-on inspection of the heart. Once we've decided that we will accept the heart, we perform what's called warm dissection. And essentially what that is, is getting as much of the work done before we actually put the cross clamp on, in which case the ischemic clock starts ticking. It's important to remember that there needs to be careful coordination with the recipient team at home so that our timing works out just right. Once all teams are ready, the patient is systemically heparinized. I then place a preservation cannula into the ascending aorta. The superior vena cava is tied off. The inferior vena cava and the left atrial appendage are incised and the heart allowed to empty. This is important because we want the heart empty when we place the cross clamp to avoid distension and damage to the heart. Once the cross clamp is applied, a cold preservation solution is instilled. 
Ice is poured into the chest cavity. Once the preservative infusion is complete, the IVC and SVC are transected, the aorta and the pulmonary artery are transected, and the left atrium is either taken at the level of the pulmonary veins or through the atrium if the lungs are being procured as well. The next set of slides just shows in an illustrative manner exactly what we do. This slide on the left, or sorry, this picture on the left shows the preservation cannula here in the ascending aorta. The superior vena cava has been tied off and cut, and the inferior vena cava has been incised. These dotted lines here show where we will eventually transect the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Flipping the heart over, this just shows how we open up the left atrium to be able to create the cuff in order to perform the transplant. This is the actual view that the surgeon has when he or she is at the field. These dotted lines are the eventual cuts. These are the right-sided pulmonary veins, left-sided pulmonary veins, pulmonary artery, aorta, and superior vena cava. To actually remove the heart, the first process is opening up the inferior vena cava, as mentioned before. The pulmonary veins are then transected on the right. The left pulmonary veins typically require the heart to be elevated to reach. Once these are transected, the only thing remaining is the aorta and the pulmonary artery, which are then completed. At this point, the heart is packaged up in cold storage for transport. We also take lymph nodes for a cross match. The entire donor team travels back to the recipient OR. And as mentioned before, the recipient team are the ones who are responsible for coordinating timing of implant. The best possible scenario is the donor team returns with the donor heart right when the recipient team is ready to sew it in. Once the cross clamp is on at the donor hospital for the procurement, the clock starts, and that four hours will become important in just a moment. So in summary, donor heart procurement is an important part of heart transplantation, and I would argue the most important part. Procurement is a highly coordinated process with multiple teams participating at the donor center. Once the procurement is complete, and actually even before that, when the cross clamp goes on, the ischemic clock is ticking. A successful procurement relies not just on accurate cutting for removal of the organ, but on good organ preservation. Now we'll move on to discuss the science and background behind cold preservation, or how we're able to remove a heart, transport it many miles to a recipient, and start it back up again. So cold preservation is the mechanism that allows for the donor organ to be removed, kept viable, transported, and eventually implanted in a recipient as a functioning organ. A word on ischemic time. Ischemic time, it represents the time where the organ is not getting blood and therefore not oxygen. A true maximum ischemic time is not known because it is known that the shortest possible ischemic time is the best. Importantly, different organs can tolerate different lengths of ischemic time. For the heart, it's typically recommended that this ischemic time be kept less than four hours. Some centers are pushing that out up to six hours. For the lungs, usually less than six hours, although some centers push it out to eight. Liver and kidney can withstand longer ischemic times, 12 hours and 24 hours plus for the kidneys. What we do know is that younger donor organs can tolerate longer ischemic times. In general, longer ischemic times can lead to increased primary graft dysfunction, decreased survival, both short and long term, and decreased functional capacity of the recipients once they recover. Cold preservation relies on two principles. One is controlled hypothermia, and two is a preservative solution. So when we talk about hypothermia, we're talking about a specific range, four to eight degrees Celsius. This decreases metabolic activity as well as demand. The preservative solution is responsible for cessation of cellular electrical activity. And for the heart, this means a nice prompt diastolic arrest. Also, it's responsible for protecting the organ, not only at the cellular, but at the tissue level. Important is that hypothermia does not stop metabolism, but rather it slows it down. This works by decreasing cellular energy requirements and decreasing the rates of biochemical reactions and enzyme activity. It also decreases degradation of key cellular components needed for tissue and organ viability. 
there is a one and a half to two-fold reduction in enzymatic activity for every 10 degree reduction in temperature. This slows the release of autolytic enzymes, which can lead to cell death. This also decreases mitochondrial damage. And if you remember, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It's where all energy production takes place. It also leads to decreased inflammation and decreased apoptosis or cell death. There are many commercially available types of preservative solution, UW, St. Thomas, Plegisol, NIH, Krebs. We happen to use UW. Um, some centers even make their own. The main goals, again, are to achieve a hypothermic metabolic arrest with a nice prompt diastolic arrest of the heart. In addition, to preserve cellular structure and tissue structure and viability during the period of hypothermia. And finally, to reduce the deleterious effects of reperfusion injury, which we'll talk about in a moment. Although each preservative solution has different concentrations, there are several key components of all preservative solutions. One are sodium and potassium. This is what's responsible for the rapid myocardial cellular membrane depolarization and arrest. Metabolic nutrients. This is so that we can provide some energy even though the cells are in a low metabolic state because they're not entirely metabolically inactive. Free radical scavengers. These protect against cellular damage from ischemia reperfusion injury. And then finally, an acid-based buffer system. As these organs are no longer in the, in the host where the blood has its own acid-based buffer system, we have to provide a synthetic one to maintain neutral pH. So hypothermia and preservative solutions can delay cell death. However, they can also activate processes that can negatively affect the organ. These include, but aren't limited to, cellular swelling or swelling at the cellular level, extracellular edema or swelling at the tissue level, cellular acidosis, reperfusion injury, calcium overload, and endothelial injury. It's important to note that the additives in the preservative solution can help mediate these effects. So cellular swelling. We're going to have to go back to cell biology here, but you may remember that all cells have a sodium-potassium ATPase pump. And the reason for this is to maintain high concentrations of sodium and low potassium outside of the cells, creating osmotic pressure. This enzyme activity is decreased with hypothermia, as all enzyme activity is, and this leads to decreased membrane potential. This can lead to sodium and water entering cells, which can lead to swelling and bursting. Colloids, saccharides, anions, different components in different solutions, provide an artificial osmotic pressure gradient to counteract this. Extracellular or edema at the tissue level, this can arise from interstitial fluid buildup. And this can be from hydrostatic pressure from preservative solution flush during procurement. It's one of the reasons why a lot of centers, ours included, make sure that we perfuse the solution at an even pressure throughout the procurement. This can lead to capillary disruption or uneven distribution of the preservative solution to all of the myocardium. So-called impermeants or starches and colloids will increase the oncotic pressure in the intravascular space and help reduce the extracellular edema. Cellular acidosis. So without oxygen, accumulation of lactic acid happens from anaerobic glycolysis through the Krebs cycle. Acid production itself can injure the cells directly it can also activate the inflammatory cascade and the cytokine response, which can injure cells. By adding glucose to the solution, we help limit the lactic acid production and the amount of anaerobic glycolysis, and hydrogen ion buffers will keep the pH neutral even with the production of lactic acid, which is inevitable. Reperfusion injury. So during the period of hypoxia, there's an accumulation of anaerobic metabolites. Once blood flow is restored, oxygen is reintroduced. This oxygen can combine with the anaerobic metabolites and cause oxygen-free radicals. These molecules can cross-link proteins, cleave peptides, even disrupt the DNA. They're incredibly harmful to the cells. Antioxidants that are added to these solutions act as free radical scavengers and can help mitigate this effect. Calcium overload. So normal calcium levels can vary and do vary between systole and diastole in heart muscle tissue. Levels are typically kept stable with a sodium calcium exchanger as well as a sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium pump within the cell itself. 
again, with hypothermia, we get decreased activity of all enzymes, including these, and also a decrease in ATP due to anaerobic metabolism. This increase in intracellular calcium can lead to cell injury. One additive in the solution is ADP, which provides not only a substrate for energy, or ATP, but also helps, uh, helps restore this enzyme activity and keep the levels of calcium stable. Endothelial injury. Normal endothelial cells in the heart and the body synthesize nitric oxide and prostacyclin. These molecules allow vascular smooth muscle relaxation. There's a decreased production of these with hypothermia, which can lead to microvascular vasoconstriction. High potassium in solutions has been shown to preserve the production of nitric oxide and prostacyclin, therefore mitigating the, effect, the effects of microvascular vasoconstriction. So in summary, cold preservation relies on hypothermia as well as a preservative solution. This method allows for a limited period of ischemic time prior to a successful implantation. For the heart, this is four hours. Cold preservation, while helpful, can also have a deleterious effect on the donor heart at the cellular and tissue level. Additives in preservative solution help mitigate these effects. Now we'll move on to learn about the traditional methods for cold preservation. This is based upon the same basic principles of hypothermia and preservatives that we just spoke about. Interestingly, the setup has not changed much since the first transplants. This you may hear referred to as a three-bag system because that's what it is. The heart, once removed from the donor, is placed in a bag of cold preservative solution. This bag is then placed in another bag with saline. These two bags are placed in yet a third bag with saline. These bags are then placed on ice in a cooler. And this is actually how it looks. This is a procurement surgeon who has taken the donor heart, has it in all three of the bags, and his assistant is going to tie it up with an umbilical tape and drop it into the cooler. There are issues with traditional cold preservation. There's incredible, not only user variability, but protocol variability among centers. The amount of preservative solution, the temperature of the solution, how much ice is in there? Do you put ice just in the cooler? Do you put ice in the bags? Do you put ice in all three bags or just two bags? Do you put ice below the heart or on top of the heart? This leads to an inability to control the temperature and a wide range. And this is overall temperature, and as you'll see in the subsequent slides, temperature of different parts of the heart. This leads to uneven cooling of the donor heart. Too warm, and we set ourselves up for ischemic injury. Too cold, and we lead to protein denaturation and cell damage. And interestingly enough, most people worry about hearts being too warm. However, it's hearts being too cold that are not only more common, but also more dangerous. Additional issues with traditional cold preservation. Water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, but preservative solution freezes at lower temperatures. It's the same reason why we spread salt on our sidewalks so that we can lower the temperature and we don't get ice formation. This means you can have a liquid solution in your hands on the heart that's less than the freezing temperature of the cells in the heart themselves. Donor hearts in traditional cold preservation storage can reach temperatures of less than 2 degrees Celsius in as little as 30 minutes. Less than 2 degrees Celsius begins the process of cold injury. By the time we get down to 1 degree Celsius, there can be irreversible suppression of diastolic function in the cardiac myocytes. By the time we get down to 0 degrees, proteins become denatured, and a lot of these effects are irreversible. So why haven't we changed our methods? Well, for one, the three-bag method is easy to teach and it's easy to learn. Two, it's inexpensive. It's three plastic bags, sterile ties, and an igloo cooler that you can get from Walmart. In addition, in surgery, there is a strong sense of tradition and a strong sense of resistance to change. And the quote down there I put, because pretty much it's applicable to all areas of surgery, if you ask somebody why they don't change, this method has always worked for us. Or the corollary or follow-up to this is, if it's not broke, broken, why fix it? 
In summary, traditional methods for cold preservation have been used since the beginning of heart transplantation. The system is inexpensive and easy to learn. However, there can be extreme variability in temperatures of the donor heart, and this variability in temperature may lead to adverse effects. Now we're going to look at novel methods for cold preservation. The Paragonic Sherpa Pack is FDA approved for use in the United States and has CE mark approval in Europe. We at Centera began using it in the end, uh, at the end of 2018. Hallmarks of this system include full immersion in the preservative solution, so even coating and temperature effect from the inside of the heart and the endocardium and the, and the chambers of the heart to the outside of the heart itself and the epicardium. In addition, there's controlled organ temperature, keeping it in that ideal range, four to eight degrees Celsius, up to in testing, up to 40 hours. Now, I don't think tomorrow somebody's going to try to reach, uh, try to push a transplant out to 40 hours, but knowing that it'll go that far certainly sets up the ability to push our ischemic, our ischemic limits. In addition, there's real-time monitoring and data collection. No longer do we have to guess how cold is that heart. And like with most things, there's an app for that. So on your iPhone, you can get real-time Bluetooth delivered data. And more importantly, at the end of the procurement, when you return to the hospital, your coordinators can actually download a log to prove and show how cold or how warm that heart was and that it was in that range. What we've seen is a, poten a potential saving for the hospital and the system by reduction in primary graft dysfunction, use of ECMO post-transplant, ICU and overall length of stay. And most importantly, the cost of the system itself is reimbursable, both by Medicare and private insurers. So how does it work? So this is a Sherpa pack that's been expanded so you can see all the parts. Here is the donor heart right here. Right above that is a connector, and this comes in multiple different sizes. This is attached to the donor aorta and secured with an umbilical tie. This connector and the heart then get connected to the actual lid of the inner sterile canister. In this lid is a temperature probe. This inner canister, which is sterile, is then placed in an outer canister. Initially, that's sterile, and then that's passed off to the OPO assistant at the donor site. All of these are then packaged up within the Sherpa pack itself with the cool ribbons in the pouch, and then the system is closed. The system itself has wheels and a handle for easy transportation, and most importantly, a display here which will let you know exactly in real time what the temperature of the heart is. This also has Bluetooth data transmission which can go directly to your iPhone. These are the instructions for packaging, and yes, the three bag method is simple. This is also very simple. So again, taking a look at, at the picture on the left, the first step is the heart is positioned on that adapter and put into the actual lid of the inner canister. The OPO assistant has already filled number one, which is the inner canister with cold preservation solution. And you can keep this solution as cold as you want right until you're ready to use it. Once the lid is on, the inner canister is then placed into the outer canister the outer canister is placed into the Sherpa pack once the Sherpa cool ribbons and cooling system are in there. Then finally, it's closed, and then pressing a button on the front starts the data logging and the temperature. So this is a picture of what it actually looks like to put a heart in the Sherpa pack container. So what you can see on the picture on the right, this heart has already had the adapter attached to it and sewn on with an umbilical tie. This is what it looks like in that inner canister. And two things of note. One is that by filling up the inner canister and purging all of the air out of here, we have uniform cooling of uniform liquid both inside and outside the heart. And secondly, this heart is uniformly suspended in the solution itself. There's no cold or warm spots in the actual container. So what this graph depicts are some of the differences between the traditional cold heart storage and the Paragonic Sherpa pack system. So the actual donor procurement, as we talked about, is the same for both methods. That's the preparation of the heart for transport. With current heart storage, again, the heart gets placed in a bag, solution is added, we tie the bag. 
We then place this, this bag in another bag, and here's where some of the variability comes in. Do we add ice slush? Do I add more than my partner does? Does our center do it differently than another? Same thing with the second and then the third, and then the bags are placed in a cooler. Sometimes these are covered with ice slush again or ice water. Sometimes the hardest is left on ice. So incredible chance for variation here in these steps. As opposed to the Sherpa pack, the hardest placed in the canister using the method that I've shown you on the other slides, the lid is sealed, it's put in the Sherpa pack, and you're done. When you return to your recipient center with the heart and prepare the heart for implantation, with the traditional system, you have no idea how warm or how cold that heart is. In addition, this system actually has to be reprocessed and reused because it's a cooler. With the Sherpa pack, not only can you, be, can you be assured that your heart has stayed at 4 to 8 degrees Celsius, if you don't believe it, you can actually download the data and see. And this is a single-use disposable system, nothing to reprocess. So here is some of the data actually behind the Sherpa pack. And what you're looking at is data that's, that's from experimental pig heart models. Okay? Temperature here is on the x-axis, or y-axis, sorry, and time is on the x-axis. In terms of the two different samples, paragonics is in red, and the traditional cooler method is in gray. And the first thing that I want you to notice is that right away there is a difference between the apex and the ventricle in terms of their temperatures. And this makes sense because it's going to have to take some time before the solution equilibrates and the heart muscle equilibrates too. What you see for the Sherpa pack is that this is not only in range right away, but the ventricle and the apex get very, very similar throughout the rest of the time. For traditional cooler method, where again the heart is not suspended uniformly and different parts of the heart may be exposed to different parts, particles of ice and things like that, the apex starts off very, very cold, whereas the ventricle itself starts out relatively warm. What you can also see, remember, the ideal temperature is in between 4 and 8 degrees. With the traditional method, the apex gets to that 2 degree range within 30 minutes. And again, at 2 degrees, starts to see, you start to see those deleterious effects of cold storage. The other thing to keep in mind, too, is especially with the new allocation system and us having to travel further for the hearts, at least in our center, the majority of hearts end up coming back to us in between 2 and 3 hours. Okay, with the traditional system, that apex has been below 2 degrees Celsius for a significant amount of time. Again, that's the dangerous too cold period. In addition, the ventricle or the workforce of the heart is also reaching that dangerous part, that dangerous temperature rather. In contrast, with the Sherpa pack, we've stayed in that nice range the entire time. The other thing that you can see is that obviously in time here, this is pushed out to six hours. As I mentioned before, our guidelines generally suggest that we stop our ischemic clock at four hours, meaning we have to plan for an organ to be able to get it back and reanimate it within four hours. Now that we know that we can keep the temperature at least controlled for another two hours, who knows how far we may be able to push ischemic times in the future. This is real-world data from both the United States and Europe. This is 49 patients with the Sherpa pack system. These are actual data from the temperature logs that we talked about. What you can notice is this. You can see that the ischemic time goes, or the transport time rather, goes all the way up to four and a half hours. In fact, 43% of these runs were more than four hours. You can also see that in all of them, the temperature remained between 4 and 8 degrees. There were no adverse events or device failures in this group of 49. Now the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you data that's actually from our center that was presented by one of my partners at the ISHLT this year. So what we found was that using the Sherpa pack system, Re, uh, resulted in a 71% reduction in primary graft dysfunction. As I mentioned before, we began using the Sherpa pack at the end of 2018. So what we did for this was we looked at our 22 prior transplants before we used the Sherpa pack and compared them to the next 14 which were with the Sherpa pack. Admittedly, this is, these are different patients and it's not controlled, but nothing else changed during this study other than what we did in terms of cold storage. So with the cold storage method, the traditional method, we had 9% of patients with severe primary graft dysfunction, 
23% with moderate primary graft dysfunction. And although primary graft dysfunction may not be able to be avoided altogether, it's these nine patients that really get themselves into trouble, need things like ECMO, can have worse outcomes. With the Sherpa pack, not only did we not have any severe primary graft dysfunction, we reduced our moderate primary graft dysfunction to 14%. This, this led to a complete elimination of ECMO use post-transplant with the Sherpa pack. Again, in 2018, these were 17 patients, the ones right before we started using the Sherpa, and with the first 14 patients after using the Sherpa pack, going from 12%, which is two patients, to 0%. And here's what's the important part to remember. ECMO is very expensive. The average cost of ECMO is between $100,000 to over $300,000. So saving these two patients from ECMO would have saved the system almost $700,000. In addition, we found a 15% reduction in length of stay and ICU length of stay using the Sherpa pack. Again, this graph over here, 2018 before use of Sherpa, this graph over here after we adopted Sherpa. So what you can see in blue here, ICU days went from six to five and a half, and more importantly, overall length of stays went from 14 and a half down to 12. And again, where this really pays off, literally and figuratively, is the actual cost savings. The average cost of an inpatient day is $7,500, an ICU day almost $20,000. So the cost savings for reducing two and a half inpatient days and a half of an ICU day is almost $30,000. And then the most exciting thing that we found is represented on this map here. So once we adopted the Sherpa pack and we were happy with the results, we sought to ask the question, could we travel further for donor hearts? Again, this is a map very similar to the one I showed you before from Google. This is our center here, and this is roughly a 500-mile radius. Now, with our cooler method or traditional cold preservation, the furthest we went out was 547 miles. Every once in a while, there is a donor organ that's outside of our area for which there are no recipients able to be identified in their area. We got one such call. It was over 1,000 miles away, okay? We were able to use the Sherpa pack to transport it and were able to be assured that our heart was going to be kept in that ideal range the entire time, which it was, and we had a successful transplant with this. So our program is looking to expand our maximum travel distance based on this data. So in summary, the Paragonic Sherpa Pack is a novel method for cold preservation. The hallmarks are that it keeps the donor hearts at a uniform temperature in that ideal range with uniform cooling inside and outside of the heart. There's a potential, a potential for reduction in primary graft dysfunction, post-transplant ECMO, and post-transplant length of stay, which can lead to better outcomes and lower costs. In addition, and most excitingly, Sherpa Pack has the possibility of expanding the range for our donor procurements. In closing here, our new allocation systems mean that our recipients are going to be sicker. And because of the new sharing agreement, there's going to be longer distances required to travel for donor hearts. There are more recipients than potential donors, so we need to ensure excellent outcomes for each donor and each recipient. All preservation methods are based upon cold storage. However, novel preservation systems may improve upon current techniques and lead to better outcomes. And in the end, as these are a scarce resource, we need to have excellent preservation for success, not just for our patients, but for our program. Thank you very much, and I welcome any questions at this time. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kemp. Um, we're now going to go ahead and transition into our Q&A session. Um, before I uh, go ahead and turn it back to Corey, I would just like to remind everyone that if you do have any questions for our presenter, please be sure to submit them using the chat feature. As a quick reminder, that's going to be located at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Additionally, um, during the Q&A discussion, I will have this poll up. So for those of you that are listening in a group, if you could please just complete this poll and let us know how many people are participating in your group, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and so with that being said, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Corey to moderate your questions. Thank you. 
All right. Thanks very much, Tiana. And Dr. Kim, thank you so much for an insightful presentation. Uh, we do have one question that's just seeking some clarification about the new allocation system and verifying that sure. the one you're speaking to is, is solely for hearts and, and not for all organs. Is that correct? That is correct. This is just for hearts. Okay. Excellent. And so what effects is your program seeing as a result of the allocation change? So one thing that's interesting is it used to be that patients with LVADs that had complications such as driveline infection or low flow alarms would get hearts relatively easily. Those were the former status 1A. Now that those patients are status 3, they don't tend to get as many donor heart offers. The flip side is that patients on ECMO with the, other, with the old allocation system used to be the sickest of the sick, but they were still in the same category as the patients with a driveline infection that were at home. So we see two things. One, it's very difficult to get a patient with a stable VAD a heart. And two, it's a lot easier to get a patient who's very sick on ECMO a heart sooner. All right, excellent. And um, another question, do you feel comfortable pushing the ischemic time to six hours now with the Sherpa pack as opposed to four? Gotcha. Um, we, we certainly do feel comfortable pushing the boundaries of the ischemic time. Um, I wouldn't say that we're ready to go to six, uh, but internally our goal is to increase our ischemic time in 20-minute blocks. And what we want to do is make sure that we're not compromising the quality and the safety and the performance of these hearts. So right now our maximum ischemic time is the recommended four hours. Our goal is to increase that to four hours and 20 minutes. And then if those patients do as well, increase it out you know, um, sequentially until we get out there. Whether we'll get to six hours or not, I'm not sure, but I know we can push it past four hours and do it in a safe manner. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, another question we've received is um, what preservation fluid do you use and how much integrated solution do you use after cross clamp? Gotcha. Um, so we use UW solution. Again, there's, there are multiple different solutions. I use um, a different solution in training, and there, uh, multiple centers use different ones. Um, we typically use two liters to get a rest, and then we fill up the Sherpa pack itself with preservative solution as well. All right, excellent. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question from Martin that says, great presentation and materials. Is it possible to get a copy of the presentation? Uh, so Martin, yes, to answer your question, we will be sending out um, a PDF version of these handouts um, following the presentation. So, and if anybody uh, has any other you, questions, I'm... oh, go ahead. Oh, no, please go ahead. Oh, I was going to say as well, in the presentation will be my email. If anybody has any other questions, please feel free to email me as well. Excellent. Thanks so much. So, Dr. Kemp, how was this new technology introduced into your program, and, and what kind of uh, training is entailed with that? Sure. Um, well, I do have to give my partner, Dr. Jonathan Philpot, credit for finding the Paragonic Sherpa Pack and bringing it to us um, for evaluation and eventual use. Um, he was the one that first contacted Paragonics. Paragonics came down and worked with us, and there was a lot of hands-on training with them. Not that it was difficult to learn to use the system, but more importantly, um, they were very supportive of us when we were using it. Um, customer service was great in terms of going on runs and things like like that, and it truly just took you know one run or two to be able to know how to do it. Um, the other important thing to do too was to get our coordinators who travel with us facile with the system. Once everybody was up and running with it, it's been it's been no problem whatsoever to use it. Excellent. We have a um, another user cost. Um, that if you could uh, provide an estimate, uh, approximately how much does the device cost and are there any disposables involved with it? Gotcha. Um, in terms of pricing, I'm honestly not sure about that. That usually gets handled through our finance department. I have asked this question before, and um, the, w the way it gets reimbursed is through Medicare and private payers, and it is being covered. In addition, the cost savings of decrease in ECMO and decreased length of stay um, more than pay for the device itself. If you have any specific questions on pricing, I'd recommend you talk to Paragonics about that directly. Okay, excellent. Thank you. 
And um, do you feel that consistent temperature and monitoring of, uh, would be useful for other organs, not just heart? Yes, I, I really do think it would be. Um, you know, what's so interesting, and this is what my partner, Dr. Philpott, says all the time, we just assume that by putting it on ice, it's going to be okay. But why would you want to assume when you know you can keep it at the exact temperature you want for a long time? Um, obviously, all organs tolerate ischemia differently, which is why hearts can only be ischemic for usually up to four hours, and other organs can be pushed out further than that. But if we go based on the principle that shorter ischemic time is better and uniform cooling is better, I would imagine that a uniform cooling device for other organ systems would be useful as well. All right, excellent. And um, one final question I see here. Um, how has your program uh, changed as a result of this new technology being adopted? Are you noticing any changes in procedures or outcomes or, or anything of that nature? Sure. Um, since adopting the Sherpa pack, I think we can at least eliminate one variable that's always out there in terms of primary graft dysfunction, and that's the temperature of the heart itself. Um, it has made us able to, as I mentioned in the last slide there, push our boundaries for where we're able to go get donor hearts, and it makes us more confident that when we do get either an older heart or a heart that's further away, that it's going to be stored properly and come back in good working condition. Um, the allocation system itself kind of sets the number of transplants the center does, but if we have a case that is further out, we can at least rest assured that we know we can preserve that organ and bring it back safely. Excellent. Thank you. Um, a question from Anthony here. Has your center used the device in any pediatric cases to date? Uh, we, we actually have not used it for any pediatric cases, only because we don't do pediatric heart transplants at our center. Okay. Thank you. And um, we have a few other questions that are rolling in here. Do you prefer this to a heart being actively perfused by a machine? Uh, what are some pros and cons that you see there? Sure. Um, well, one pro of this, of this device is, it, is that it's FDA approved, and if you want it tomorrow, you can get it. The hearts being perfused by a machine are only available in a trial. There's an incredible amount of complexity that goes into a heart being perfused on a machine and a lot more cost involved. One of the things I love about the Sherpa Pack is how simple it is and how easy it is to use. So to be honest, I wouldn't prefer a, a beating heart machine for the simple fact of you can only get it in a trial, it's more expensive, and it's harder to use. All right, excellent. Well, that looks like all of the questions that we have at the moment. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Clint Kemp for being available for such an insightful presentation today. Um, and uh, like he said, uh, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to him um, or to our sponsors, Paragonics. Um, and that will conclude today's webinar. So uh, again, our thanks to Paragonics for sponsoring today's webinar. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to follow up with us. We will be providing all of the slides out to uh, today's participants as well. So uh, thank you to everyone for attending, and we wish you a happy Thanksgiving and a wonderful rest of your day. Take care.